Hello there, Wind Energy students. It's Dr. John Shragi, and today we're going to be talking about, uh, in a very long lecture, about section uh, 3.4 of your textbook, which is about different kinds of meteorological instruments that you're going to be able to encounter at a uh, like a prospective site for a wind farm, or maybe uh, as part of monitoring the conditions at a solar uh, power plant or something like that. And uh, some of these are definitely instruments that you would see at such a site. Some of these are more like instruments that would be at a weather station operated by you know, the National Weather Service or the Federal Aviation Administration, but they give you a sense of the kinds of instruments that we have at our disposal. Now, all the instruments that we're going to be talking about in the first four parts of this lecture are examples of instruments that collect what we call in situ observations. Depending on what atmospheric science courses you may have had before, you may or may not be already familiar with this term in situ. Um, if I just put the Google card about define in situ up, it talks about it being like in its original place or in its original position. Um, that's not quite the context of the word in situ that we use in science. In the context especially of meteorology, in situ observations are measurements that are taken by instruments that are touching what they're measuring. A thermometer measures the air uh, temp the temperature of the air that it's touching. A barometer measures the pressure of the air that it's touching. That's in contrast to remote sensing, where you are taking measurements of something without actually you know, being in physical contact with it. Uh, the classic example of that would be like a telescope. Okay, A telescope isn't touching some you know, Jupiter or something. It's, it's measuring it from a distance. Um, X-rays or um, uh, like satellite pictures or something like that are radar, another example of remote sensing. But the first four parts of this long lecture are going to be about in situ observations. And you can see a big long list of the kinds of instruments we're going to be talking about in these first four parts over here. Remember, it's not necessary for you to do this entire long lecture in one sitting. That wouldn't be a reasonable thing. It's designed for you to be able to sit down and watch maybe two or three parts of it, come back later, and watch rest more of it. So as we start kind of picking our way through this list of instruments, it wasn't until I already had this set of PowerPoint uh, slides set up that it occurred to me that I'm not sure I would necessarily say the three that I have marked there with arrows are instruments. Uh, more accurately, the term that we would use for them is to say that they are platforms. They are, uh, they're, they're a framework on which we are going to be putting instruments that we will be using to measure uh, the weather. But there was sections on these in your textbook, and so I just included them without really thinking it through. Um, but the, let's talk first about weather, about weather stations, okay? Now, the word station is sometimes something that I know like intro students get hung up on because they're thinking weather station, they're thinking of station in the context of like a radio station or a television station. The word station in the context of weather station is more like train station. Okay, it's station in the sense that it is stationary. It is a site where you have maintained records for a long period of time about the weather at that position. Okay, you have a station where you are having different weather instruments. And they could be sites that you are operating as part of like your employment for a power company or something. Or they could be uh, part of like, you know, some uh, the network of weather stations that's actually run in an official capacity by the government. And I have there just sort of parts of a map just to give you a sense of where the United States government maintains weather stations that are part of its routine monitoring of the weather. These stations are run cooperatively by the National Weather Service and the Federal Aviation Administration. Both of those entities have congressional mandates to monitor the weather for safety in the case of Aviation Administration or uh, agricultural purposes and safety and uh, public safety purposes for the National Weather Service and so on. Most of these uh, weather stations are co-located with airports uh, just because we need to have real-time weather information for the safe operation of aircraft. Uh, here's a picture that I tend to use in these sorts of slide decks uh, of a weather station at an airport and there are specifications about what, how we cite these instruments. Those specifications are usually set by the World Meteorological Organization and those specifications are designed to help make these observations as representative as possible. 
Um, you wouldn't want to try to take these observations, say, on the roof of a building or at street level in a big city or something like that because of obst obstacles to the flow and things like shadows and things like that. In general, there's a, a whole lot that goes into the consideration of how they cite one of these observations. I just, I don't expect you to know these particular uh, requirements that I have listed here. I just, you know, kind of did a screen capture of one of the pages from the documentation of, of how you cite such a weather station. But you all, like, you know, it says you have to be over level terrain, it has to be over earth or sod, it has to be typical of the area around the station, at least 100 feet away from extensive concrete or paved surfaces. All attempts need to be made to avoid rough terrain, areas where water tends to pool, areas where drifting snow tends to collect, things that are going to make the area right there different in kind of a micro scale way from the area more broadly representative of the region that you're trying to sample the weather for. And while those are guidelines for official weather stations, they are all good ideas for something like the weather station that you would be establishing as part of like a wind turbine farm uh, operation for a power company. Uh, turning back to that picture of the weather station, I do want to draw your attention to, oh, you can see how there's a whole bunch of weather instruments mounted in different ways, but notice that a number of the instruments are actually housed in what we call shelters. Sometimes you see instrument shelters, sometimes you see Stevenson shelters as the word being used. We'll just use the word shelter in general. Uh, you might also, by the way, sometimes see the word screen. I've never really understood why the word screen applies here, but sometimes those boxes that the instrument's in are called screens. And the idea is to help um, avoid sunlight. Uh, certain meteorological instruments don't work, don't provide reliable measurements when they are in the sun. Uh, a thermometer is the classic example. If you measure the temperature with a thermometer in the sunlight, what you, the thermometer itself is absorbing shortwave radiation from the sun, it itself is warming just due to it being in the sun. You want the instrument to be uh, housed in a instrument shelter. Uh, here's a close-up view of two very different ones, an older one that's kind of a wood birdhouse looking thing, and a more modern one that is the sort of canister uh, with these uh, aluminum louvers around the edge. But the louvers are what I wanted you to, to notice here. See how the, these, these shelters are actually very well vented to the outside world so that environmental air, that is air around the shelter, easily flows through the shelter. Uh, that way you are measuring things like the air temperature. Um, particularly temperature, uh, uh, just to give you a peek inside of that one shelter there, uh, there's a thermometer you can kind of see in one of those pictures there. And there's some other instruments that tend to be inside of the instrument shelter as well. Uh, you also generally want to measure pressure outside of the wind. Uh, you don't want to be, uh, we'll see why when we talk about barometers, but and pitot tubes, but you don't want to measure pressure in a place where the wind is touching the barometer. In practice, because the pressure tends to be the same indoors and outdoors, most of the time the barometer is actually inside of a building at the airport, like at the control tower or something like that, or at a National Weather Service office, rather than actually out in the shelters. Although if you had it outside, it would have to be in the shelter to keep it out of the wind. Overall, the sighting of the weather station is dependent on all the kinds of considerations we learned about earlier in this module. You want representativity and things like that. The choice of the instruments will be based on things like precision and accuracy and resolution and so on. There's no particular reason at this point for us to talk about that in the context of weather stations. Um, now, in contrast to weather stations, we t I, mean, I guess you could say that this could be part of a weather station too, but off when we talk about a weather station, we're always talking about instruments at approximately ground level. Okay, there are standards as to like how high above the ground we measure the temperature at an official weather station. There are standards of how high above the ground we measure the wind. It's usually like three meters or something like that. I can't remember exactly the number off the top of my head. But that is for the standard observations that we call surface observations. Now, for purposes of something like a power company or something like that, you would often want to be measuring the parameters like the wind speed and the wind direction somewhat higher above the ground, more someplace higher above the ground, still in the boundary layer, but maybe more like at the height of the rotors of your turbine, or um, you know, there could be other heights that are important to you that aren't necessarily at the surface, and that's why we have measuring masts or meteorological masts. A mast is a freestanding tower which carries meteorological instruments like thermometers and anemometers and so on. Um, there's a nice picture there of a type of mast right there. If mast is a word that you're not familiar with, 
um, you know, you can pull up define mast in Google and you get um, a number of definitions. I like the one that I marked with the star that is a tall upright structure on land, especially like a flagpole or a television antenna or radio transmitter. Okay, so these are a tower like that, okay? It's, a, it's like a flagpole or a, or a tower. They, um, they are sighted in much the same way we have to sight a, a turbine. I mean, a, a, well, a turbine, but a weather station. We have to choose where we're going to put it. And the sighting of the mast and the decisions about the instruments that you're going to mount on the mast and at what heights you're going to mount them and so on all depends on the kinds of considerations we learned about earlier in the module that range from representativity to um, costs and so on. I mean, there's a number of considerations that went into how do they decide to put that mast there with those instruments. The physical structure of the mast itself, the superstructure of the mast itself, comes in two different varieties, the so-called tubular masts and the lattice masts. And the one that you see there in that picture is an example of a tubular mast. A tubular mast is kind of like a flagpole, okay? It's, a, it's just a steel or aluminum shaft into the ground set in concrete, and the instruments are mounted to it at some point. It's a relatively cheap and easy thing to set up, uh, and the mast itself is, uh, is not going to disrupt the flow around it very much. That's always a problem with any kind of weather instruments, is you're always worried, how is the instrument disturbing the winds that you're trying to measure? Uh, you, know, you can well imagine if you had a big, complicated structure to this mast or to your weather station, the weather station itself could be upsetting the winds, and you're not measuring the winds that are very representative of the large-scale area. Um, the problem with these kind of masts, uh, these tubular masts, is that they can't really be all that tall. Uh, your book threw out the number of 80 meters. 80 meters seems like a very tall mast, uh, a tubular mast to me. I've never, I don't think, seen one anywhere near that high. Um, but, um, you know, they are a relatively cheap and easy way to go. If you need to go higher than that, you need to switch to a lattice mast. Now, a lattice mast is like what you see right there, where it's, it's, a, it's a built structure. Um, it is manufactured, maybe not necessarily on site, uh, although it might be put together in pieces on site. Uh, and they can be very, very tall. And you could be thinking about something like a cell phone tower or a radio transmitter tower or a microwave uh, relay tower or something like that uh, that you would see from the highway as an example of a lattice mast. Now, they may be even stayed with these guy wires like you can kind of see in this picture right here. Now, this is a much more expensive structure. Okay, this is definitely a much more, this is a project. It's going to take a team a fair amount of time to put this thing together. It takes, um, takes specially trained people to do these things. Um, I used to live in a rental house where my landlord, that was actually his job, is he was uh, trained as a state inspector of lattice masts, which you wouldn't think is a job, but it is. Um, you know, they had to be inspected, and he went out and he knew that they were assembled correctly, and they weren't going to collapse, and they were properly stayed by guy wires and all this kind of stuff, and that was his job. He drove around and inspected lattice masts. Um... On the other hand, this thing is going to be more disruptive to the wind. I mean, it's it. There's a lot more going on here. There's a lot more friction between the atmosphere and the winds and the and the structure of the mast itself. Um, this thing is going to heat up during the day. It's going to cool off during the night. It's going to be disruptive to the things that you are measuring. But it can be a lot taller. I mean, if our tubular masts were supposedly limited to about 80 meters, but in practice are usually more like 10. Uh, these things can really go. I tried to find out what the tallest meteorological mast out there was. The best I could find was on this Wikipedia page where this particular meteorological tower in uh, Russia is 310 meters. Now, that is pretty darn high. I mean, when I do my research in West Africa, the kind of clouds that I like, that I study, I study these nocturnal uh, stratocumulus clouds, they're about 100 meters above the ground. So these are, you know, this is, don't get me wrong, those are very low clouds, but but, you know, this would be three times taller than those clouds. Um, 300 meters is pretty high. It's still in the boundary layer. We're not up in the free atmosphere yet. But this is definitely a big, tall tower that can be used for meteorological purposes. There's no doubt about it, though. It's an important consideration to be worried about the way these meteorological masts are affecting the flow and disrupting the flow around them. And in order to make the observations of the flow that you're going to be taking with wind vanes and anemometers more representative of the large-scale flow, 
in general, you don't just stick the thermometers and the anemometers and so on right there to the side of the mast itself. They are usually mounted some distance off of the mast from a using a boom. A boom will be extending out some number of meters away from the mast. If boom is a word that you're not familiar with in this context here, uh, again, you can pull up a Google definition of boom. And the one that I found here that worked for me was that it's a long rod or a pole. It's a spar, if that's a word you know. It's a spar that can be mounted, you know, 90 degrees off of the mast. That Then you mount the instruments out on the end of this, and you're kind of away from the structure of the mast itself, uh, more so. Now, the truth of the matter is the boom itself disrupts the flow to some extent. The boom itself has issues of like, you know, if you have thermometers out there or humidity, the boom itself is warming up in the sunlight and cooling off at night. I mean, the boom itself is a problem. And so in practice, actually, most of the time, especially measurements like temperature and so on, are taken at the end of long within poles at the end of the boom. So you're even farther away from the disruption of the flow uh, caused by the mast and the boom. And you can see this becomes kind of recursive, right? I mean, now you have to worry about how the pole is disrupting the flow. But at some point, we have to say that's far enough, okay? Uh, and we just, you know, that, that's good enough. Uh, but anyway, this is uh, this, the way we design a meteorological mast. Um, now, masts are an important source of meteorological information in certain kind of contexts, but let's not kid ourselves, these are much more difficult to maintain. If there's concerns about some thermometer at a weather station at, mounted in a Stevenson shelter, you send an intern out to go and open the little door. You always send an intern out because those, those Stevenson shelters, those instrument shelters, they're always full of wasps and stuff like that. Uh, so you send them out there and they go and they replace the thermometer or they figure out what's going on or the mercury column is separated and they ping the, the thermometer a little bit and it's fine. Okay? Um, that's a whole lot more complicated on a meteorological mass because you got to get up to the height where the thing is. Okay? And especially on like a lattice mass where you might have mounted these instruments 100, 120, 130 meters up, you know, this is going to require permits and technicians and so on. It's just a whole lot more complicated to maintain these things. And they can fail in spectacular ways in like high winds or when there's uh, ice accumulating on them during like freezing rain events and so on. Uh, the right word for that when like ice or snow accumulates on your um, meteorological instruments and your platforms like your mast is called icing. That's not a terribly exotic term, but just so you know it if that word comes up in a homework set or on the quiz or something, when ice accumulates on there and it can, you know, result in the collapse of the tower because it wasn't designed to bear that weight or something. Um, <laughs> icing, by the way, is in general a problem in meteorology when it comes to instruments. I mean, instruments are, by definition, kind of out there in the elements, and when there's freezing rain or, so, or freezing fog or something like that, the instruments get crusted with ice, which greatly can influences their performance. Even if the meteorological instrument is still sending data, there's no particular reason to think that it's sending correct information. Do we really think that that anemom cup anemometer that's right there is reporting correctly the speed of the wind when it's covered with a thin layer of ice, or, or a thick layer of ice for that matter? This usually requires that instruments need to be heated. Okay, I mean, it's actually not as simple as you might think to just stick an instrument out there. Usually you have to have some sort of plan that involves there being power to the weather instruments that they can in some way detect when there's ice accumulating so that they can be heated. Obviously not a thermometer, that would be problematic. But, you know, like wind vanes and anemometers and so on generally have to go through a lot of procedures to make sure, especially at a situation where they are at an unmanned station or up on a mast someplace, that they are not accumulating ice, they are not experiencing icing. And for that matter, we're going to learn more in a future lecture about meteorological masts out at sea. Uh, this happens to be Cape Wind, which I love that name, which is a meteorological mast off of uh, Massachusetts or Long Island, I can't remember. Anyway, but it's a, it's a famous meteorological mast at sea, and in a marine environment where there's going to be things like sea spray, you're going to have similar issues with regard to sea salt. Now, sea salt is not going to accumulate so much that, like, my mast or my boom is going to collapse due to the weight of the salt, but the salt gets everywhere. It, it's going to be encrusting on the, um, you know, the anemometers and the wind vanes and so on. You're going to have to have a plan as to how those instruments maintain, uh, you know, how will we know when they're getting out of calibration because of accumulation of salt and so on.
all that's really complicated. All these instruments require a plan as to how they're going to be maintained, how are they going to, how are we going to check that they're calibrated, and so on. Now, before we move on to part two of this lecture with more in situ observations, let's talk, uh, let's give you three quick questions. Question one. Meteorological observations from above the top of the boundary layer, that is in the free atmosphere, are taken by instruments A, at weather stations co-located with airports, B, on lattice masts, C, on tubular masts, or D, none of the above. How do we get the observations from above the top of the boundary layer in the free atmosphere? Make a choice from those three, four options and get a little feedback before you move on to question two.